My new favorite book is this book called um, What Passes for Answers by the poet Kael Ko. This book was launched a couple of weeks ago, and at the launch, uh, he shared an anecdote of another poet friend. And the poet friend had witnessed a wall of graffiti with graffiti so offensive that it almost touched the truth. This story resonated with me because I could conjure the moment of that person doing the graffiti, standing in front of a black wall, and taking a list of all the offensive things he could possibly say, and having to choose which ones to testify to. I feel that as a writer, that is my life, I face a blank wall every day, and I must be able to imitate that sense of freedom, but also that sense of fear, that without fear, what exactly would I testify to? And for this afternoon, around a dozen of us are here, and we must testify to the things that matter to us. To check on what matters most to me, I naturally went to Facebook. Yes, because that's where the truth lies, somewhere out there. And I found picture after picture after picture <laughs> after picture after ridiculous selfies after selfies. But obviously, what matters to me are books. Books matter to me. Back to our graffiti man, I feel that I've said something very offensive as well. Why exactly should I say in front of you in my 18 minutes of fame that books matter? It seems better to say that peace matters. It seems better to say that jobs matter. Better to say that money matters. And yet I stand here all four feet and 10 inches of me and say that yes, those things matter, but books matter as well. In the face of poverty and destruction, absolutely, books matter. In the face of natural calamities and tragedy, absolutely, books matter. In the face of terrible governance, there is no better weapon than books. To say that books matter is to say that memory and language matter. Memory and language are the human elements that propel human life. But memory, by nature, is ephemeral and not built to last. And what language does is it takes the raw material of memory and gives it form, using syntax, using sentence construction, using text, so that we may never forget. And we can demarcate things into past, present, and future. Language is the habitation of memory, so that we may have entrance into the past, and we may have access to the future. To say that books matter is to say that the human enterprise of living matters. You know, it's all the same for us. We will all live and we will all die. We share the same narrative arc. There is a genericness to human living. And yet, books do otherwise. Books have the ability to zero in on an individual's life, a nation, a people, a community, and say that this life is new, it's different, it's unrepeatable. How strange the ability of books to make us realize that we're just like everybody else. Yes, we live and we die, but it's the stuff in between, actions, consequences, and choices, that is the stuff of a hero's life. To say that books matter ultimately is to say that art matters. We presume that when books come to us, they come fully enfleshed. And yet, from the backstage production, it takes years to make a good book and years to make a bad book, yes. <laughs> the choice of cover, book design, book layout, format, smite zone, handwoven, handbound, whatever, are all aesthetic choices. Creativity and imagination as fuel prove that dreaming matters as well. The child that books built by Francis Buford. And he talks about how a human being is made by the narratives that he chooses to read. And we call the back of a book a spine. And we have an authorial spine and a book spine. But he also says that a human being has a spine based on the books that he has read. How exactly did my love for books begin? It begins here at six years old. There. I wanted to post a picture of my family to embarrass them forever. <laughs> that is my brother Coke, the violinist on the right. 
my brother Chino, the cellist, and my artist sister, Plep, Balipata Borlongan. Those are our dogs named um, Brahms and Melody because my mother was a musician of sorts. And this is me at six years old. My story begins here at six years old. My father brings me to Comtrust along Aurora Boulevard. I am the writer in the family, and I know I am in the middle of a tragedy. I know this in the way my father's joy is so set. I feel like he's brought me to the bank to kind of like act as leverage to the manager. And we're sitting there, and I'm making pa cute in my crocheted outfit, and a man enters the bank, and he's holding books for sale. He enters, and my eyes go, <gasps> and he knows it's going to be a sale. And he does the most dangerous thing on earth, is he gives me the chance to hold the books. Diba? How dangerous is that? <laughs> he, these are like the Frebel can books. They're all, yes, do you remember? Okay, they're all like fairy tales. He gives them to me, and of course, I smell them, diba? The worst thing you could do, because that's the way to love a book is to smell it. And I open, <laughs> I open the book, and it lands on the letter Q. It's an alphabet book. Oh my gosh, and the letter Q, it's just transformative. There's something about the cue that changes my life. The curly cue of that cue, like a hook into a book. I peer at my father and there is despair in his eyes, but there is greater love. And even though I know we can't afford it, he buys me these books. At 12 years old, I experienced my first heartbreak through a book. My parents, my mother is here at the very back row. My parents are voracious readers. My mom can finish a book. Uh, she finishes around three books a day. Kidding. Three books a week. <laughs> She's not superwoman. Um, and my mother and father, I think the best thing I loved about them was that there were no barriers to these books. There was no such thing as you had to be the proper age to read the book. So I read Arthur Miller very young, and I read Annie Nin very young, and I read Colette very young, which might explain many things. <laughs> but I picked up The Kill a Mockingbird, and there is something strange about entering a book you're not quite prepared for. You're not quite ready for, but you have the relentlessness of comprehension propelling you. You want to understand the book. And I finished halfway, and there was school, and I ran to my mother, and I said, can I be absent tomorrow to finish the book? And my mother, because she's my mother, said, absolutely. And the next day, I'm in my room, full blast ng aircon, Kumot up to my chin, and it leads to the very last page, this amazing last page, which to me is still the best last page in all of lit. Atticus, when they finally saw him, why he hadn't done any of those things, Atticus, he was real nice. The second to the last paragraph is this, most people are scout one when you finally see them. What I like best about books is their ability to illuminate dark corners. You know, there are words for certain things, and you're not always sure what those words are. The strange moments in between human beings. And it felt like I had always known this, but I did not know it until someone put it in a language I could understand. This might be why I chose to become a lit professor for almost 20 years. Yes, I'm only five years old. <laughs> Because, you know, the magic of teaching someone how to read and the magic of comprehension is what fuels my life, really. And I taught Western, the Western canon most of those many, many years of teaching, and I taught the Iliad and all of this and all of that. And what I learned from the Western canon was a general view of the world, information that gives me a profession. Ask me about modernism, I can give you a lecture. Postmodernism, I can give you a lecture. Renaissance period, so on and so forth. But I did not know who I was until I fell in love with Philippine Lit. Uh, there. What Philippine Lit gave me, if the Western canon gives me a general view of the world, what Philippine Lit gave me was a specific sense of myself. Getting to Manuel Argilia's Midsummer. Words, bull, jar, hands swung, square shoulders, Flick the rump of the bull with a rope in his hand. What it gives me is recognition. This is who I am. This is my experience. I am a Filipino reader. The truth is, books are the most dangerous things in the world. They're weapons of a different sort. And here, a list of the most banned books in time. 
<laughs> it makes you wonder why Alice in Wonderland would be banned. Okay? What exactly was so fearsome about the queen? The queen I met at six years old and the queen in Alice in Wonderland. Did people perhaps know that that metaphor stood for something really, really evil in the world? I have taught Madame Bovary all those 20 years. The sexiest scene here happens during an agricultural show. Nothing really happens. I mean, she does have sex, but it's really not that shocking. And yet, Gustave Flaubert had to be charged with indecency. And yes, the Bible is still banned in, cer in certain parts of the world. As Filipinos, we are not strangers uh, to revolutionary books, correct? I suspect three things, in fact. One, I suspect that in the DNA of every Filipino are the dreams of Chrysostomo. And I think in this particular period, it is the dreams of Sisa that fuels us, the dreams that she had for her sons, the dreams that we have for the children of the Philippines. I suspect that we once found ourselves through books. At the crossroads of our history, it was the books that really changed our future. And therefore, I suspect that it will have to be another book that will propel us into the future. We are revolutionary artists of a different kind. We really use our art in order to revolutionize ourselves. So we will have to read good, good books. It will have to be our job to read and to demand good books, not just from the Ateneo de Manila University Press. <laughs> no pressure, please. <laughs> but that they will have to be available from Canvas, Jokna. They'll have to be available from all publishers in the Philippines. I would like to end by reading my favorite poem from my favorite book, The Dune by Kaelko. Poetry with lilies can't stop thanks, neither can poetry with thanks. This much is true. Here is more or less how it happens. You sit at your desk to write a poem about lilies, and a clip of 9 millimeters is emptied into the chest of a mother in Zamboanga. Her name was Hamira. I sit at my desk to write a poem about thanks, and a bako in Ampatuan crushes the spines of 57. I'm trying to find another word for bodies. The task of poetry is to never run out of words. This is more or less how it happens. I find another word for bodies, and Hamira remains dead. Her son was with her when she was shot. I didn't catch his name, don't know if he died. Perhaps he placed lilies on his mother's grave. Perhaps he was buried beside her. One word for lily is enough. There is enough beauty in flowers. I want to find beauty in suffering. I want to fail. Books matter because memory and language matter. Books matter because the human enterprise of living matters. And books matter because art matters. I hope that I have offended you well. Thank you. <laughs>